All right, so let's pick up with some range of motion. Uh, range of motion, or ROM, ROM, is a, uh, a measure of flexibility, or joint flexi flexibility. So a measure of joint flexibility. So here's an example of, um, this is going to be range of motion for the elbow joint. So you can see that we've got our fulcrum here in the middle, and you'll see that from a neutral position, some people can actually go up to 10 degrees of sort of hyperextension, overextension of that joint, and then all the way up towards, are we okay? Yeah. And now I need to go to the hospital. So <laughs> Okay, we got a serious question here. Sometimes like they say you like hyper extend the knee. So that's not a good like because there it doesn't seem like a bad thing to hyper extend. Well, but controlled hyperextension is not necessarily a bad thing. Hyperextension of the knee is typically done when you apply too much force and you move the knee. The knee really doesn't hyperextend that well. I mean, it, standing here, that would be the neutral position. And I mean, I can maybe go another two degrees. That becomes an issue when it's like five or ten degrees. Oh, okay. okay. So I, I don't know, maybe you call that hyper hyper extension. <laughs> I just hyper hyper extended. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> a measure of joint flexibility, and really it's an angle measurement. So we are measuring the angle through the entire joint. <laughs> hyper, hyper, entire, entire, <laughs> angle through the entire movement of the joint. Now, why can't we just like <laughs> start rotating my head and just start going? <laughs> Some animals can, right? The owl can be standing there and the owl can turn the head all the way around and look at your back. Hyperextension. I don't know how to raise it. Like, so that is so But can it literally turn like all the way around? No, it cannot turn all the way around. It can go in one direction, just over 180 degrees, and then just 180 yeah, degrees. So I have to come direction. back. <laughs> yeah, if you walk around the tree, it just goes. <laughs> and pretty soon you get it to a point where it goes, it, it, the head has to unwind and it spins so fast it goes. <laughs> so why can't we just like move our joints in an in infinite amount of ways? Well, because we have limitations. <laughs> So we have limitations. Um, what are some of those limitations? Well, we have these things called bone markings that you're now familiar with. And you'll recognize that the bone of one side of the joint a lot of times will move into the bone of another type of joint. And we may have a depression there that allows or com accommodates that bone movement. But that eventually, those bones are eventually going to come very close together. And that's going to be one of our limitations is going to be that bone markings or those bone markings near the articulations. Don't confuse that with ovulations. Uh, we also have different levels of tautness of our ligaments. 
And so you may hear, oh, man, that girl is so flexible. And it's just maybe because she's got looser ligaments. And it could just be a genetic thing. It could be an estrogen thing. It could be a guy because of the estrogen thing. Also, the length of the opposing muscle is going to be a limitation. So, length of the opposing muscle, tautness of the ligament, or the bone markings near the, limit, near the articulations are all going to be things that limit movement. I mean, you, you notice your bicep, your bicep that actually begins to contract enough there that my forearm is not resting on my bicep. So I guess if I had smaller biceps, I'd be able to theoretically go even a little bit further. Or if they were like really huge, I'd just do it. <laughs> I can move 40 degrees. <laughs> Did you just say that with Bryce? <laughs> You're huge, Bryce. I guess that's what they're saying. I personally don't see it. <laughs> but I could even see something. Oh, Bryce, you're not, you know, you just have to get a great letter of recommendation. Otherwise, you'll go and tell on me. <laughs> All right, so joint movement. Um, well, we're shifting gears now. And, and range of motion applies in towards that joint movement. You'll see things like hyperextension, flexion, fully flex. These are all movements through that range of motion. There are a bunch of different types of joint movements. And we can also describe these joint movements and quantify joint movements. And the way that we do this is we sort of run in our mind or in a computer model uh, an access through the fulcrum of the joint. So our joint movements are going to occur around some axis of rotation. I feel like I just looked over at y'all, and you were all like looking above my head. Like, what was going on above my head? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Am I like up here eating a can of cat food and I don't realize it? <laughs> I, I look you I looked at all of you and you were like what? We were what? looking up at you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know how to respond to <laughs> So the axis runs perpendicular to uh, the plane that we can describe the motion. Right, so in this picture, the bore will represent for this guy in the sagittal view, we have elbow motion that we can describe, and it's going to be in the sagittal plane, and then in that sagittal plane, I'm going to run an, an axis, axis perpendicular to that surface. Okay? And so by setting up the, the model in that form, the joint can be described in the number of planes and axes that can be used to describe motion. So elbow, right? I rotate my elbow. It's basically only moving in that sagittal plane. Whereas my shoulder, I can move my shoulder in that sagittal plane. Or... I can move it in my frontal plane, or I can even move it in the transverse plane as well. So the joint is going to have 
a variety of different movements that it can make, a variety of different axes it can rotate around and planes that it can rotate within. When a joint moves through three planes, we refer to that as a multi-axial joint. Okay? And we use a descriptor called the degree of freedom. to describe how many planes it can move in. So the multi-axial joint will have how many degrees of freedom? I heard of that, but three. So shoulder here, I can actually move it in really three different... I can move it in three different three different uh, points. So it's going to have multi-axial characteristics and three different degrees of freedom. If the joint can be th moved through two different planes, how many axes is it going to have? Two, and what do you think we would call that? Yeah, biaxial. Bi. <laughs> How many degrees of freedom? I'm just going to read degrees of freedom as F. Two. Two. Now the elbow joint here, really we can only move the elbow joint in one plane. So what will we call that? Mono. Monoaxial or sometimes I've also seen it as monaxial. Either way, I don't really, it doesn't bother me either way, and that would be just a single degree of freedom. So what would be an example of biaxial? Your, your hip, you can abduct and adduct, and then you can extend and, and flex. Finger too, as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do the little, the, the weird way. Mm -hmm. It's just getting really weird tonight. <laughs> okay, so um, each of these. And, and really, you kind of jumped ahead a little bit, which is great, because each of those different types of, of joint axles um, is going to relate to a specific type of joint. So really, our joint types, which you can see a variety of different joint types here, are going to be defined based on the axial characteristics. Based on the axial characteristics. So multi-axial joints. The most common multi-axial joint Something like a ball on socket, which is shoulder here. Biaxial joints will be joints that have two directions of movement. One type of joint is the condylar or the ellipsoid. So here's an example of the condylar or ellipsoid, and you can see that is going to be the joint that we have here at the base of, uh, of the phalanges. Those are the proximal phalanges where they 
connect up with the um, the metacarpals. Uh, saddle joints, and you can see a uh, saddle joint here, such as the joints that we have in the wrist. Knock on the door. I don't even know why we need to do that. I guess maybe why. Oh. <laughs> and then we also have plane joints. And the plane joint, um, you can see that here. It's very similar to the saddle joint, except for they don't really fit in a uh, saddle into each other. Uh, so these are bones here, the bones of the foot, the, the tarsus. The monoaxial joints, and the monoaxial joints, uh, just a single joint of movement or single uh, movement and we have two of those, the elbow, which is a hinge joint, and then a pivot, which is the joint that we have there between the humerus and the radial bone, which has that very interesting circular structure at the tip of the bone. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about here with our types of joints or our, our synovial joints really are going to be types of movement that these joints can go through. And here's a bunch of examples. And what you're going to notice is for the most part, with just a couple exceptions, you have movements that basically antagonize each other. So flexion and extension do the opposite thing. Now, whenever we use movement or, or try to describe joint movement, we always have to come from a starting point. What do you think our starting point is going to be? Knee. We're going to always start from the anatomical position. That's going to be our zero, zero point, so to speak. So everybody stand up and show me the anatomical position. Nailed it. Nailed it. Now everybody do a jumping jack. And describe all of the motion. No, she's kidding. She's kidding. I didn't say sit down yet. All right, Paige is the only one who gets extra credit tonight. Yes! You get a quarter of a point. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I might need that quarter of a point someday. All right, so starting from the anatomical position, flexion. Flexion is going to be a reduction in joint angle. So decrease the joint angle, and that's going to be coupled with extension, which is just going to be the opposite and increase in joint angle. So from the anatomical position, I really can't extend my elbow joint. I can do a little bit of that hyperextension, but really, in order to experience or describe extension, I have to describe it from my deviation from the anatomical position. All right, so let's go ahead and just knock the rest of these off real quick. The next pair is going to be abduction and adduction. And a lot of times I hear these two things sort of overemphasized because abduction and adduction really almost sound very similar. And so a lot of times people say, okay, adduction. <laughs> or adduction. Abduction 
it's going to occur in the frontal plane. In fact, both of these are occurring in the frontal plane. And this is going to, uh, abduction is going to occur when we go away from the midline. So anatomical position, I can abduct the hip, abduct the hip, and that's going to swing the leg out, move it away from the midline. Ad, adduction, adduction, is going to be back to midline. Our, our next pair, our next pair is going to be elevation and depression. Uh, again, both of these, uh, maybe I'll just do this, both of these are frontal plane movements, just like these were frontal plane. Elevation and depression. Elevation is going to be to raise a body part. Now, we're not talking about raising the hand because we're talking about the joint. And if you look at this, I'm not raising, I'm not raising the joint, right? I'm actually rotating in that joint. This would be, uh, um, this is going to be a different type of motion. So rather, if I want to raise the, the body part, that would be elevation. That movement there, shrugging your shoulders. And then, Ooh. Putting, and then putting it back down is going to be depression. So raise them up for elevation and then depression. <laughs> the next pairing here is going to be uh, a transverse plane. That's supposed to be an H. That's a terrible H. This is going to be transverse plane. Transverse plane. And they're going to be protraction. and retraction. Protraction is going to be a forward movement. And then retraction is going to be a backwards movement. So this is that picture here illustrating protraction and retraction, moving the head out, the chin out, or moving it back. If you ever go down to Atlanta, you'll see a lot of protraction and retraction because all the doves down there, all the pigeons down there. Are... All right, the next one doesn't really have a partner, but in all reality, it sort of does. The next one is circumduction, and that's really a combination of a couple different motions here. So circum, circumduction, and circumduction is a circular movement. And so you can see circumduction here, like pitching a softball. And really what circumduction is, is we're going to have that circular motion. And so I get a little bit of flexion, and then I get a little bit of abduction, and a little bit of extension, and then a little bit of adduction in that movement. So circumduction is flexion, followed by abduction, followed by extension, followed by adduction. Now, circumduction is a little bit different than our next example, which also is a um, sort of a, a one that doesn't have a partner. It's going to be rotation. Rotation is a little bit different because it's a movement of the body part around a longitudinal axis.
and the longitudinal axis is going to be an axis that goes right through basically the transverse plane goes right through the top, from top to bottom, superior to inferior. So that rotation is probably one of your favorites because it's this right here. But it actually can occur, you'll notice that the motion can be in this direction or back in this direction. So I can, those would be two movements and then these would be two different movements and I can put them all together to shake my head. So we can actually break this up even a little bit further and we can have medial rotation. So starting over here, sniffing my shoulder and then coming back in towards the midline is going to be medial. So this moves us back toward the body. And then if I think my shoulder smells bad, I will laterally rotate away from the body to get back over so I can sniff it. All right, last, last two types of movement here. Was, was there a question? Yeah. So last two types of movement, supination and pronation. And I can't decide which nation I'd rather live in, the nation that serves a lot of soup or the nation that's a pro nation. <laughs> Supination is going to be an out, outward rotation, and this is typically reserved for the limbs, especially the arms. Okay? So, outward rotation, we always start in the supinated position, right, with our thumbs up. And then if we rotate in, that's going to be pronation. Yes. This is so far off. Now, in terms of describing the foot, if you walk on a duck walk, you're going to be supinated. If you walk on the center of your foot, you actually are considered to be in a pronated state. And then if you walk on the inside, I would not need or whatever, they would call that over pronated. Okay, let's move on to some of the more interesting things. So we're going to pick up with muscle, and we're going to start out with some really um, basic gross anatomy for the muscle. So we have chapter 10 now? Yeah, I think this is chapter 10. This is now, yeah, chapter 10, muscle system, and we'll really, really get nitty-gritty with muscle tissue. So you can start a brand new note, uh, outline in your notes. If you want to call it something, you can call it muscles. And we're going to start out really with just kind of that brief kind of 300,000 foot view of some muscle function. And then we'll really begin to get into the anatomy and then we'll really get into the physiology underlying that function. So muscle functions. I'm going to give you five different muscle functions to begin this lecture. One is movement. 
and the way movement is going to be accomplished is the muscles can apply force or place force on bones and organs. So movement is accomplished through the application of force onto mostly the bones, but also um, uh, some organs as well. Uh, one of the main organs where we have movement, anyone know what it is? The eyes. The eyes. Yeah. Is that what you said? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said the diaphragm? Yeah, I don't know where you got eyes. But yeah, sure, yeah, it is. Eyes. No, that's incorrect. It was the diaphragm. Was the correct no, actually, the diaphragm is, is not the correct answer. Eyes <laughs> is the correct answer. <laughs> So that would be an example of one of our organs, it would be the eyes. Most of the other movements are, are bone, pulling up on bones of the forearms that would cause elbow flexion. Another function is stability, and muscles are going to maintain a application of force, what we're going to call tension on the joints in order to resist unwanted movements. So you might also refer to stability as postural control and just helping so that we can overcome the constant effects of gravity so we don't constantly move all over the place. Muscles are also going to be very important in control. Uh, and when I say control... Not control, but control. <laughs> I don't even know how to aim to get it even close. <laughs> Control. The muscles are going to maintain openings for our vessels, and this will provide function. So, control to maintain openings of vessels. Okay. Maintain openings for other vessels to provide some unique function or additional function. Okay, so eyes, uh, the eyelids opening and closing, mouth opening and closing are examples of maintaining the openings. Um, digestive system or vasculature from the circulatory system uh, are maintained by smooth muscle. Muscle is also uh, going to be very important in heat production, production and temperature regulation. Muscle is considered to be the metabolic tissue. It's a very metabolically active tissue. And in the cells of muscle, in particular skeletal muscle, we have thousands of exergonic reactions that are occurring. And an exergonic reaction is a reaction that generates heat. Endergonic will pull heat in. During the reaction, exergonic is producing heat. And some of that heat is going to be used to help maintain your body temperature. And then the last function is glycemic control. And glycemic control, our skeletal muscle alongside of uh, really our liver is going to be the two main locations for storage of glucose. And so you eat a meal, 
and the glucose that's not immediately required is going to be packaged up into a molecule called, what's the molecule called, sorry, molecule for glucose and metals? Glycogen. Glycogen in skeletal muscle and liver is really, really solid at producing glycogen. And so those tissues act as a reservoir for glucose. And then when we need glucose between meals, we can call it out of the glycogen. Now, when we talk about the physiological system that's known as the muscle system, from a technical purpose or a technical perspective, the muscle system is going to include three types of muscle. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. But really, when most anatomy physiology professors teach on the muscle system, they limit it just simply to the skeletal muscle, the muscles that are involved in moving the skeleton. And the reason that is is because Cardiac muscle is part of the heart. It's the only place that we find cardiac muscle is in the heart, and so it's better to talk about it as the pump in the circulatory system. Smooth muscle we find it all over the place. We find it in the vasculature of the circulatory system. We find it in the uh, digestive tract, in the gastrointestinal tract of the digestive system. We find it in the urinary bladder of the urinary system. We find it in the reproductive system, both male and female. And so typically when we talk about smooth, smooth muscle function, we reference that in context of the physiological system or the organ system that we're discussing. So we'll talk about regulating blood flow, and it comes from local blood flow, I should say, blood flow in the capillary beds, and it comes from smooth muscle contraction. And so we'll talk about smooth muscle during the circulatory system to describe that. So for the next five or six hours of lecture, we're going to basically be talking about skeletal muscle. And yes, we are going to do five or six more hours tonight. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to learn anything. <laughs> that was a me. That was her. Both of them just called you up so I hard. You gave us the death look. I, I did not I give you the death look. <laughs> the death look comes with me in the night. Yes, the axe that I carry around. You want the axe? I'll get the axe out. <laughs> you know, I was driving down the road as a little kid. I, you know, I was riding in the back seat of my parents' car. <laughs> I was riding in the back seat of my parents' car. Yes, I was driving. We used to have, I'm so tall that we, we had such a small car, we used to take the front seat out and I would sit in the back. <laughs> no, um, so I'm riding in the back seat of my parents' car. I'm like, I'm like seven years old and I go to this guy. And this guy reaches down and pulls out a revolver and points it at me. He's like, go oh, no, <laughs> Yeah, pretty weird. Why would he do that? Like, that's a psycho. Yeah, I mean, that's a great ex <laughs> I mean, maybe it was a fake gun, I don't know. Still not. Yeah, still not. Still not. <laughs> it's not the creepiest thing he could have done, though. <laughs> so, uh, muscle gross anatomy. Muscles are composites of several types of tissue. And really, when we talk about a muscle like a bicep or uh, I don't know, hamstring, rectus femoris, gastrocnemius, soleus, bracialis, those are all individual organs. And as an organ, 
it's comprised of tissue that we'd call muscle tissue or skeletal muscle tissue, but it also incorporates fat, it incorporates vasculature, it incorporates nervous system supply, and it's collectively going to be the organ muscle. You can see in this figure the um, basic muscle anatomy for all of our skeletal muscle. And really what you're looking at here, it would be like if I just came in and like ripped my shirt off and then I like just totally just cut my bicep off and I put it down on the table and then I hacked it with a cleaner. And then I passed out. And <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> oh, God. Do it! Do it! I fucking hate you! <laughs> so, kind of imagine that all going down, and, and like I'm just, like, I'm just fine living here. My arm is gushing, gushing blood, and I'm like, I have five minutes to finish this. Yeah. Right. So, and I pick that up and I show it to you. That's what you would look That's what it would look like. That's what, that's what you would see. <laughs> like exactly like that? Exactly. Like this was, I did this, a picture. This is an actual photograph from earlier tonight. I got it back together. It grew back. What? <laughs> so, what you can see in this picture is that we eventually basically get down to a muscle cell. And that's what we call a muscle fiber. So, as you look at this picture, you can pull out little portions of each of these little surfaces until you get down to this level here, and that's called a muscle fiber, which is the cell of the muscle. Now, the thing that's really unique about the muscle fiber is it has a cell membrane. <laughs> Forgive them, Father, for they know not oh. what they do. <laughs> muscle fiber is a cell of muscles. It has things like a cell membrane. It has mitochondria. It's packed full of cytoskeleton proteins, and we're going to talk about those because that's really the... Um, uh, the cytoskeletal proteins and the way they're organized is what actually facilitates muscle contraction. But there's one very unique characteristic. And that very unique characteristic shows up right here in this figure. These cells are multinucleated. Now, that is if they are a skeletal muscle cell. So they're multinucleated. Now, above, and, and this is what you can see here, we've kind of reflected back this, there, there's an a outer layer over our muscle cell, okay? And that outer layer over that muscle fiber is going to be referred to as a fascia. And really what we're going to see is that there are different levels as we go from the fiber out to the whole muscle, there's different levels of this fascia wrapping around the different levels of structure. So the individual muscle fiber, muscle cell, has its own fibrous covering, and you can see that's called an endomesium. It's a fascia. It's a connective tissue.
And the reason that connective tissue or that fascia exists is it helps to group the different levels or parts of the muscle together and compartmentalizes that muscle. That's compartmentalizes. And you know it is compartmentalized. Now, the, the fascia that forms is going to be given an overall root of mesium, M-Y-S-I-U-M. -S and then based off of where it is, if it's the very inside, it's endo. If it's uh, going to be around the um, individual fascicles, it's going to be the perimesium. And then if it's around the whole muscle, it's the epimesium. Does it make it stronger the more it goes in because of all layers of the, the fascia? Does that make sense? It's like no. the one covering on the individual. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what your question is. You asked me if, if it makes sense, and it doesn't make sense. <laughs> When you, I mean, okay, looking at the individual muscle fiber, okay, it's multi Okay. Uh, it's got one fashion. Yep. And then the next thing, is that another fashion? I mean, is that, is that the way it is? Like, yeah. So if you look inside of here, these are all a bunch of different individual muscle fibers, and each of them are basically contained within fascia, okay. called the endomesium. And then we have a layer of fascia here around that whole bundle. Uh -huh. And that's called the paramnesia. Okay. And then around the whole muscle itself, we have the epimnesia. Mm -hmm. Cliffhanger. Let's, I'm, I'm done. <laughs>